Good evening. As I said a little while ago, and we've had nobody hired, a lot of this information about these wonderful women came from contemporary diaries and letters back to headquarters in Edinburgh. Uh, and we're so lucky to have all of this information preserved. I think it's amazing that, that the overview of the British government and the British army towards women serving in the front lines, particularly medical women right at the front, and particularly medical do female doctors, uh, was quite outrageous in retrospect. We're going to look at one group of these amazing women who set up the Scottish Women's Hospitals, and they served on several fronts in the World War I. Uh, before I have a week look at what they did, um, I want to consider the, the woman who set it up, Elsie Ingalls, um, and how on earth she managed to become a doctor, because doc female doctors were very contentious at the end of the 19th century, and it was blooming difficult to become them. So just a slight diversion for a couple of slides. There was an enormous amount of male prejudice uh, and women entering higher education at all, let alone training in medicine. Uh, and it was highly respected that women's place was in the home, full stop. In 1969, 1869, sorry, uh, the Edinburgh Seven were the first female undergraduate students to matriculate at a British university to study medicine. Uh, but the universities wouldn't offer females degrees for quite a long time. It was 1878, the first university, London University, was the first university in the UK to award women deg degrees. Some of them have been attending courses, but they weren't allowed to have their degrees. Edinburgh University didn't actually allow women degrees until after the First World War, surprisingly. In 1858, we had the Medical Act, which was the precursor of the General Medical Council, as we knew it today, and registered practicing doctors. Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell was the first doctor to be registered on the British system in 1858. She would graduated from an American medical school. She hadn't trained in England. In 1865, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson was awarded a medical qualification for her studies in midwifery. Uh, there was an organization called the Society of Apothecaries, which was still in existence when I was training, but I don't think it awards qualifications now, who would license people after passing their exams to become doctors. They didn't realize at the time that Elizabeth was a woman. Um, and after she was awarded her registration, they banned future female entrants into medicine. Sophia Jex Blake faced similar restrictions in Edinburgh. She was one of the original famous Edinburgh Seven. She sat the same examinations as male medical students, but they weren't awarded degrees. They were given a certificate of proficiency, which was sufficient to get them on the medical register, but not to give them a medical degree. In 1875, we had the Enabling Act, which allowed the universities to grant medical licenses to women. But it was up to the university to do it. And as I've already said, a lot of them took several years to agree to allow women to have their degrees. In 1875, the London School of Medicine for Women was set up. It was founded by Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Sophia Jex Blakes. She's known as JB, and it's much easier to talk to about JB. Uh, she had a terribly abrasive personality, and after a while, she had a major falling out with Dr. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, and she moved to Edinburgh and set up her own training school for women in Edinburgh. It was called the Edinburgh Hospital and Dispensary for Women and Children, and it trained women in medicine. So we come to the key women in the story of the Scottish hospitals. Elizabeth Maud Ingalls. Born in, born in India in 1864, a second block of a family of an, uh, an Englishman who was in the Indian uh, government, government service, the colonial service. She'd got older brothers who had gone off to England to school and set up families. So she was the sort of second family group that her parents had. In 
they stayed there until the Indian mutiny, uh, when the un because of the unrest, her father sent mother and daughters back to England. But she was reunited uh, with her father in 1863. In 1877, she returned to India, from India to England, to live with her father. Her mother by this time had passed away. The whole family had originally moved back, but mum didn't survive very long. In 1886, um, Elsie started training at the medical school for women run by JB. She didn't see eye to eye with JB and so ultimately set up her own medical college for women in Edinburgh and tried to train medicine that way. It was extraordinarily difficult to get the clinical experience. And a lot of these women had to travel to Glasgow for their clinical training. Even so, an awful lot of these hospitals wouldn't allow female medical students onto the wards and they were only allowed onto the wards that had women or children. A lot of consultants wouldn't have anything to do with them, wouldn't teach them. And it got really quite complicated what they were going to do. Fortunately, in Glasgow, there was um, a surgeon called William McEwen, who was ultimately knighted in 1902, who was very sympathetic to women and had felt they had much as, as much right to train as, women, uh, as men did. And so he was quite a great facilitator of these women getting a sufficient knowledge to be able to qualify as doctors. And in 1892, Elsie uh, was qualified with the licentiate of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and became a doctor on the British Medical Register. She carried her postgraduate training by working for a little while at um, the Hospital for Women in London, mentored by Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. She experienced training in midwifery at the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin. And then she came back to Edinburgh and went into practice, which of course was private practice in those days, with another colleague and developed a very successful practice. And in those days, they used to do surgery as well of one sort or another. She became well aware of the inequalities for women and especially women for working in the working classes. And she did a lot of free work with women in Edinburgh in the lower social classes. Then the battle for equality and suffrage and obtaining the vote became quite important. It came to a head with the Second Reform Act in 1867, which gave many more men the vote, but no women. And this triggered the women's suffrage movement. I want to emphasize that Elsie was very involved with the suffrage movement, but she was never militant and never a suffragette. Um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson became involved and Elsie would have known her quite well, of course, from her past training experience. And Elizabeth's sister um, was very heavily involved in the suffrage movement. And she wrote a letter to her father saying, there is no question among women who have worked for themselves about wanting suffrage. It is the women who are safe and sound in their drawing rooms who don't see what on earth they want it for. And later on, she wrote, when married women, when will married women learn that they have other duties in the world other than to obey their husbands? So she was quite militantly pro-women at suffrage and the vote. Millicent Garrett Fawcett, uh, who was president of the National Union of Women's Suffrages, was Elizabeth Garrett Anderson's sister. So Elsie had quite a lot of contact as this organization developed throughout the country. She was involved in the setting up of the Edinburgh National Society for Women's Suffrage in 67, 1867. She became their honorary secretary. She had a busy, thriving medical practice. She worked with lots of poor families. She opened her own hospital in Edinburgh and a hospice in 1904, which was a surgical and gynecological center 
in where she became very successful and had a resident medical officer appointed. Her reputation and skills grew over the next 10 years, as did the suffrage organisation, as did Elsie's involvement with it. And I think it's key to highlight here that this was an extraordinarily well organised group of women. They had networks throughout the country, both Scotland, England and Wales. So here was a body of women driven to a cause, all sitting there in the background. So when war broke out, there was an amazing body of people that could be tapped straight away. Elsie, um, the suffrage activity started. She'd been involved with the voluntary aid movement um, in response to the instability in Europe. Uh, she was 50 at the onset of war and she offered her services to the war effort. She went to the army services at Edinburgh Castle and spoke to a senior officer in the RAMC offering her medical skills and services and was basically rebuffed and told to go home, my good lady, and sit still. They didn't know Elsie. The offices of the Scottish Federation of Women's Suffragist Societies, you may recognise the building because until um, the 60s, I think it was, it was the headquarters of the Prudential Insurance Society, the two Andrews, St Andrews Square in Edinburgh. An ideal started to form in Elsie's mind and she wrote, imagine an army of women, skilled and unskilled, who only needed organising to be brought into line with the most efficient service the nation knew. So the initial plan, which she sold to the suffrage group and offered to the British Red Cross was a fully operational hospital manned entirely by women and based in Edinburgh. That didn't work out as the War Office and the British Red Cross declined the offer. And also there wasn't a suitable building to become available. So she decided to offer the unit to the Allies and she's got in the background all this body of women in the suffrage movements who were being stirred up now with the war effort. So on the 19th of August, um, 1914, so it didn't take her long to get going after war broke out, she wrote a letter to the French ambassador in London. I am directed by the executive of the Scottish Federation of Women's Suffrage Societies to ask your excellency's consideration of our scheme for organising medical aid for the help of our allies in the field. The Federation proposes to send out hospital units officered by women doctors and staffed by fully trained nurses and properly qualified dressers. The units will be sent out fully equipped to nurse 100 beds. Should Your Excellency's Government desire such aid as we are proud to offer, it will be very willingly placed at the service of the French Red Cross. Our units will be prepared to move from place to place as the exigencies of war may require and to utilise such buildings as may be placed at our disposal. And she sent similar letters to Belgium, Embassy and to the Serbian Embassy. She reported back to the suffrage group that for a thousand pounds there would be sufficient to pay the salaries of one unit of a hundred beds and each unit would consist of four doctors, ten trained nurses, six dressers, two cooks, an administrator and a clerk. So fundraising started. And it was absolutely astonishing how res the response from the women's suffrage movements throughout the country were. So let's look at France and the one in France. By the 6th of November, £2,800 had been collected. By the 13th of November, she had two units ready and fully equipped and manned. A small group went to Calais where they attended to Belgian refugees who were suffering from the typhoid fever. You may remember I mentioned that last week. 20th of November 14, 
confirmation from the Red Cross that they were actively seeking a building that would, could accommodate the unit. And by the 22nd of November 14, Raymond, now I'm going to again apologize for my pronunciations of this language, formed a former Cistercian Abbey had been chosen. It was no longer being lived in. It had been empty for quite a long time. And indeed, at the very beginning of the war, it had been occupied very briefly by the German cavalry when they almost encircled Paris. It was approximately 30 kilometers north of Paris. This is a modern day view of the Abbey. And the map uh, shows that dark wiggly line is the Western Front at the beginning of um, 1915. There's Réaumont, just north of Paris. And just for future reference, there's a little town at the bottom there called Villiers. Ah, uh, sorry, I can't pronounce it. Villiers Cotteret. The French cavalry had left a terrible mess of the abbey. In the first five months of the war, the French lost 300,000 men killed, including 5,000 officers and six, 600,000 had been captured or were missed or were wounded. So, and they had a particularly ropey medical service and it was overwhelmed. So setting out by train from Edinburgh on the 2nd of December, not knowing what to expect, this body of women from the Edinburgh women's hospitals set off. The first women doctors are pictured here, and they were led by Frances Ivans, who was a talented surgeon who had achieved a master's in surgery in Europe, not in England. <laughs> that still wasn't that far in advance in England. Only the third woman to achieve that qualification. She worked in Liverpool as a consultant in maternity and gynaecology. Her surgical skills were said to be outstanding and she volunteered as soon as the war broke out. So they arrived at this deserted, filthy abbey that had not been lived in since the nuns had moved to Belgium many years before. Could it be turned into a hospital? Dorothy Littlejohn was the cook with them. On the 11th December, Dorothy Littlejohn wrote home to her fiance. This abbey is one and a half miles from the arm. Such a nice little country town with quite good shops. The abbey itself is charming with lovely old cloisters and a real old fashioned garden with a little fountain in the middle. The inside rather posed one at first. It's so very large and so many odd staircases, etc. In fact, it is very eerie, especially as there is no light anywhere at the moment. And as you know, a candle doesn't give much. The room I had felt very musty and in the morning my dress felt so damp I was afraid to get into it so what the uninhibited portion will be like I dread to think. Cicely Hamilton who was a playwright and actress and writer and suffragist travelled with the unit as their clerk and administrator and she recorded her first impressions. On 17th December Cecily Hamilton reported, Those first few days at Roermont I shall always look back on as an experience worth having. In surroundings of medieval grandeur, amid vaulted corridors, gothic refectories and cloisters, we proceeded to camp out with what we carried. The abbey, in all its magnificence, was ours. But during those first few days, it did not offer us very much more besides magnificence and shelter. It had not been lived in for years, and its water supply had been practically cut off when the nuns left for Belgium. Hence, we carried water in buckets, up imposing staircases, and along equally imposing corridors. On 17th December, our only available stove, a mighty erection in the kitchen, which had not been lit for a decade, was naturally short-tempered. 
at first, and the supply of hot water was very limited. So, in consequence, was our first washing, at times very limited indeed. Our equipment, after the fashion of baggage in those times of war, was in no great hurry to arrive. Until it arrived, we did not, we did without sheets and blankets, wrapped ourselves in rugs and overcoats at night, and did not do much undressing. Those first few weeks, the women scrubbed and cleaned and scrubbed and cleaned. Water was limited, sanitation was unreliable, and there was no heating. Hospital. Sorry, I went back too quickly. Start again. Remember, it was January and December, so pretty cold and damp and wet. All the women, women's hospital was a novelty to the French army, and they had to pass inspection before they could be permitted to take casualties. They passed at their second attempt and took their first casualties uh, from the railhead in the town of Creel, 12 miles from Raymont, over the most atrocious roads in France that required all the skills of the ambulance drivers. But a routine gradually developed. Hospital routines evolved by degrees for staff and patients. These included the arrangements for the arrival and departure of the wounded. Dr Henry, who arrived in 1917, when the routine was well established, describes how the hall porter, having been alerted from the distribution centre at Creel, listened for the sound of the ambulances. She then blew her horn, summoning the orderlies to rush to the entrance, leaving only one on duty in charge of the ward. Each, she said, had her station as on board ship. The hard-working ambulance drivers in their winter coats made of goatskin. It was a cold job over revoltingly bad roads. The orderlies unloaded the ambulances and the stretchers were laid on the flag floor of the inner hall. Tags attached to the uniforms were checked. These gave indication of the type of wound, whether from bullet or shrapnel. Those who had hemorrhaged or, or were already suffering from infection were quickly discovered by the stench. Clothing was cut off, swabs taken and sent to the laboratory. Hot drinks were available to all, then they would be borne up the wide stairs to the next floor where the x-ray and operating theatres were ready for them. Some were taken straight to the wards. For those headed for the second floor there were 71 steps to climb. There were no men orderlies and no elevators. The girl orderlies undertook all these heavy tasks. A young Canadian orderly, Marjorie Starr, who'd recently arrived at the Abbey, recorded her impressions of the tough conditions. How we all groan when we hear that blasted horn and then we stampede for the entrance with all the blue dresses and caps of the sisters lifting the stretchers out of the ambulance. And really today, each one seems worse than the last. One arm will simply have to be amputated. He had poison gas as well, and the smell was enough to knock me down. Bits of bone sticking through and all gangrene. It will be marvellous if Miss Ivan saves it, but she is going to try it appears that it is his right arm. He went to X-ray, then to theatre, and I believe the op was rather wonderful, but I had no time to stop and see as I had to help and carry the stretchers. They came right from the trenches with only temporary dressings, and we operate and as soon as possible move them on. No pokey little wounds now, they are all serious. I mind the smell, or should I say stink of the wounds more than anything, I can't seem to get away from it. I get to bed about 9.30 and after a good wash, my own rubber bath had arrived by this time, sprinkle my bed with perfume so as to get it out of my nostrils as my clothes even smell of it. We have so little disinfectant, not enough to drown the odour of it all. The operating theatre is a horrible hell these days. An advanced hospital was set up at Ville Cotteret in the summer of 1917 and during the Germans rapid advance in 1918 the hospital had to be evacuated rather quickly um, 
at a time when it was overflowing with casualties. Dr. Lydia Henry records this. Dr. Henry remembered those four days when time did not exist. The wounded men coming in were the most severe cases. Their wounds were terrible, and in most cases they arrived at the hospital minus even a field dressing. As for the staff, for four nights and three days they worked without ceasing except for meals. We began to lose all sense of time and worked like machines. On the last morning, when we stopped for breakfast, Theatre's sister went fast asleep sitting bolt upright upon a bench, and she had to be shaken before she could be awakened. That last week at villers Cotterêts will, will ever be remembered by the staff as a terrible nightmare. The saddest sight of that last week was the seriously wounded men streaming along the roads, dead tired, and in many cases almost unable to drag themselves along. So after this very brief account of this hospital, we've really just skated over the surface. The war ended. It was in continuous action from the 15th of January to March 19. That's, Jan that's 1915 to March 19 1919. It treated 10,861 people. They managed to keep meticulous records. 8 1,752 soldiers with 159 deaths. That's the death rate of 1.83. That's almost better than some modern hospitals. 572 civilians with 25 deaths were also treated. Altogether in outpatients, they treated 1,537 civilians. These amazing women worked miracles in totally unsuitable surroundings. And the French were so grateful that as you can see in the picture, they were Several of them were awarded the Croix de Guerre medals at the end of the war. At about the same time that the French unit went out to France, the second unit of the Scottish Women's Hospital set sail from Southampton for Serbia. But let's just fill in some historical background. Serbia as a nation had had a turbulent history. Occupied by the Ottomans since the mid-16th century, and having had many skirmishes, ended in a successful Serbian revolution against Ottoman rule in 1817, which was recognised at the Berlin Congress of 1878. Its boundaries and the kingdom were finally decided after their successful victory in the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913. Then the assassination of Crown Prince Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo by the Bosnian Serb triggered the invasion of Serbia by Austro-Hungary. They declare war in July 14 and a large army gathered on the banks of the Danube and captured Belgrade. Belgrade's at the top and they did a sweeping movement each side. Unit of the Scottish Women's Hospital under Dr. Eleanor Sultan set sail from Southampton in early December. The destination was the port of Salonica, which is down the bottom there. Their help was urgently needed in the north of Serbia at Krakovac. That's that yellow blob. The Austrians were actually fought back by the Serbians in that first few weeks, but they did so at the cost of enormous casualties and they were dreadfully poor conditions. It's a very mountainous area and there was a very big outbreak of typhus, among other things. The medical services were minimal in Serbia. It had very few doctors and trained nurses and the wounded and sick were coming back from the battle, even though they'd successfully pushed the Austrians and Germans back and Hungarians back, right the way down in bullet carts, walking, and they really were in a terrible state. So the Scottish unit, having arrived in Greece, urgently traveled north 
they they moved with a stop at niche on the way William Smith was a transport officer with the Scottish Women's Hospital, Unit 2. They did have a few men with them who had been an artist. He kept ex excellent contemporary records of events, of which these are extracts. On arrival at the station, we were met by the army authorities and were taken to see the largest hospital in the town. As we approached the buildings we passed a great number of bullock wagons laden with wounded from the battle which was now nearing its close. The hospital was full to overflowing and the wounded then arriving were being placed on the road and hospital yard which was inches deep in mud until other accommodation could be found for them. These ox wagons had taken several days and nights to the journey and you can imagine the suffering of the wretched men with fractured limbs and worse injuries. Many died on the journey and their bodies were left by the roadside. A few doctors and orderlies were doing what they could to relieve the suffering but the doctors were few and the patients all too many and they often waited their turn for hours in the cold winter day before they found shelter. But if the scene outside the hospital was a pitiful one, within the doors it was a thousand times worse, and I shall never forget the scene of misery, suffering and desolation we found there. So they journeyed on to Krakovac. They were being led by Dr. Sultar and their ultimate destination to set up hospitals was at Valjevo and a couple of other centres a little bit further north of that. Bear in mind that with the donkey carts, the bullet carts, they were carting 100 bed units with all of the equipment with them. Absolutely amazing. The doctors and nurses of the SWH inured to all manner of human suffering and more or less prepared for working under bad conditions were, I think, struck dumb with the horror of it all and there was no lack of food for thought during the rest of our journey from Nish to Kragoivats. We arrived at Kragoivats the following morning and one of the many hospitals in the town was handed over to the Scottish unit. It was much in the same condition as the one we saw at Nish the previous day and which I have just described, but the whole staff set to and in a week the place was transfigured. We had brought everything necessary in the way of equipment, oven to bedsteads, blankets and clothing of all kinds and we were not a little proud of our hospital when everything had been set going. Our patients were both Serbian and Austrian soldiers friend and enemy lying side by side, seemingly on excellent terms with each other. One by one the wards were emptied, cleaned and whitewashed. The equipment was unpacked and the patients washed and tidied were tucked up comfortably in the clean beds with their bright red coverlets. The men's gratitude knew no bounds. The unit had gone out with an equipment for 100 beds they had to take over 250 patients immediately on arrival. So the women rapidly knuckled down and set to nursing the wounded and where necessary carrying out surgery. British standards of cleanliness and hygiene were not given up by these ladies in these terrible conditions. Krasvats, 13th February 1915. As for us, we are quite settled down and seem to have been here for months. The hospital is set going now and I believe we have under our supervision about 300 patients which of course is three times the number we were prepared to have but which is a miserably small number out of the thousands of patients that there are even in this town alone. We have a school and another building attached and four small gas houses for the more convalescent cases. 
The other hospitals are so badly off for accommodation, beds, clothes and comforts of any description, that the comfort of our place seems almost selfish luxury. I have never seen anything like the place we have seen since we came here. Our patients are enjoying and thriving in the comfort we have been able to give them. It was such a great pleasure to see the joy they had in being clean in a clean bed. Most of them have horribly septic wounds which through pressure of work are only being dressed every four or five days. They are nearly all young men, about twenty or twenty-five, but some of them look like fifty. We are gradually restoring their youth to some of them. When they are ill, they are very patient, and when they are well, they are lively and happy. I am sorry to say they just get well to be sent back to the ranks again. The Serbs are certainly a magnificent race of men, and live simple, good lives, and would be happy if they had not to fight. We spend most of the day doing dressings, either in the dressing rooms or in the wards. As time progressed, the demand for their services increased and they opened other hospitals in nearby places. The major workload during this time was an epidemic of typhus and enteric fever, and there were a few cases of diphtheria. The living conditions were appalling and clean water and provision of adequate sewage management was rudimentary or non-existent. The medical and nursing staff were not immune and some nurses died of illness during this period. This is the epidemic typhus which is transmitted by the body louse and spread from humans, from rats to humans. Nice little blighter. And it causes a severe illness. Most recover but some die. It can be rapidly lethal if it isn't treated properly. And of course, in World War I, there weren't any antibiotics. During the early part of 1915, there were few major battles and the Scottish Women's Hospital Unit was more immersed in the management of the disease outbreak than in treating casualties. There were still wounded that needed treatment and there still needed injuries that needed surgery. A further unit of the Scottish Women's Hospitals had arrived by now to help, but they'd been delayed en route in Malta because they were persuaded to care for the British troops for a couple of weeks who'd been injured in the Dardanelles campaign. Possibly one of the few occasions when the Edinburgh women were allowed to do something to the British Army. By July, the epidemic was over and the workloads were easing considerably. There'd been no new fighting and no new wounds for months. The Scottish women's units and other British hospital units in Serbia, and there were other organisations out there. There was a hospital run by Lady Paget, who was the wife of the previous British ambassador to Serbia. And there was the Stobart unit, another all women unit run by Mabel St. Clair Stobart, another British suffragette and aid worker. They were all considering their future. It was highly suspected that the Austrians and now the Germans in combination with them, would re-attack Serbia. And there was anxiety about their Eastern Front. For quite a while, they thought that the Allies, the British and the French, were going to send uh, a unit of servicemen to reinforce the Serbs, but it never came. In November 15, there was an overwhelming invasion burst into Serbia. German and Austria came down from the north and the Bulgarians invaded from the east. The invaders were brutal in their treatment of prisoners and in the civilian inhabitants. The remnant of the army and the majority of the civilian population hurriedly moved to retreat across the Albanian mountains to the Adriatic coast. The Scottish women's hospital at Valjevo and beyond were hastily evacuated but took back to Krakovic and decisions were taken for the majority of the units to join the great retreat across the treacherous mountains in midwinter. They split into, two, split into two parties, one under Mr. Smith and another led by Dr. McGregor, who'd had the unit that was at Malta. Dr. Inglis and Dr. Hutchins decided to stay behind with the most seriously ill patients, and they became prisoners 
continuing to work caring for the wounded, but ultimately were repatriated to Great Britain via Vienna by the Austrians. They tell the story of Dr. Ingalls refusing to sign a certificate attesting the good behavior of the German army. Her reasons and the German response to this was well known, but we think she refused to sign. It was four weeks uh, just before the German shot Edith Cavella as a spy. And I don't think she was happy to say that they'd been well behaved towards them. To take up her report, at Kragowitz, our hospital filled to the doors, 175 beds instead of the 125 we ought to have. <clears throat> and we took over two ghast houses for convalescence, 60 patients more. The sisters worked splendidly, and Mr Davidson and Dr McDougall are a capital pair of assistants. <clears throat> Dr Chesney was off with the field ambulance. We had 75 new cases to start off with and from 30 to 40 a day after that, clearing out as quickly as we could, dressing all the morning, operations all the afternoon, and the patients x-rayed on their way to the operating room. It was heartbreaking work leaving the hospital. We cleared the ghast houses and sent off every man who could walk, but even so there were left 20 bad cases with six ignorant orderlies to look after them and three doctors for all the hospitals together. We left in two parties and I went back the last thing to give the men some cigarettes. Already the whole place was in chaos, windows shut and one man with a long splint with his splint off sitting up winding up his bandages. One man with secondary haemorrhage nearly died and as everything was packed I had to have him removed to the military hospital with a tourniquet on. All this will make you understand how I came to the conclusion that if we are really to help the Serbs now, we must stick to our posts. Sir Ralph did not at first agree and especially felt that we ought to move in order to save our expensive equipment. But when he came to think of it, he realised that in his headlong retreat we cannot save it. We each got our equipment off in the first instance, complete, but it's absolutely impossible to move it now. And this is the routes that the various civilians, the hospital people, the army, across those mountains in midwinter to get to the Adriatic. Dr. Mr. Smith kept a detailed record of this retreat, and I've taken several extracts from his record. We finally got away from the hospital about noon, joined the main road, and became part of what was to be known as the Great Retreat. The road was a moving mass of transport of all kinds. Motor wagons, bullock wagons, horse wagons, men and guns besides the civilian population. Men, women and children, all intent on escape. The country here is undulating, and the procession, as it dipped into a hollow and reappeared on the crest, to dip and reappear again and again until it was finally lost as it passed over the distant hills looked like a great dragon wandering over the countryside. This procession had been passing continuously for days, stretching from one end of Serbia to the other, and one realised that this was something more than an army in retreat. It was the passing of a whole nation into exile, a people leaving a lost country. We had now tackled the most trying part of our march and should the snow continue it would mean disaster and death to thousands. As we went on the track became narrower with just enough room for the pony with pack to pass along. The snow continued for hours. The going was fairly good at first but later on in the day as it grew colder our difficulties increased. There were thousands of refugees and ponies ahead of us and with all this traffic, the paths had become hard and icy. The track was at one time at the bottom of the pass, alongside the rushing river, then there would be a sharp rise, and it would wind its way in and out to the top of the pass, with the rushing river now far below. 
By this time the going was more than difficult, and the greatest care was necessary, especially downhill. One horse fell over, and literally rolled into the river, luckily at a place not far above the stream, and after some trouble it was got out, looking a little the worse. Others were not so fortunate. One nurse of the Scottish unit died on the journey from a head injury and a fall, and she was buried on the mountainside. It took seven weeks on the trek with scarce food and bitter cold. Uh, the maximum climb over the mountains was to 7,000 feet. Uh, ultimately, everybody was removed by boat and evacuated to Italy, but not without its dangers because of Austrian submarines. Thousands of the civilians and especially frail, undernourished elderly and children lost their lives on that journey across the mountains. A Serbian writer said, if the skies were all paper and the sea were all ink, we could not even then write the sorrows of our country. Anyway, in August 1915, a group of the women uh, who were sent from Scotland to reinforce uh, the, the hospital at Valjevo went to Salonika and set up a recuperation hospital there. Most of the soldiers from uh, that retreat re-established in Corsica, retrained um, and received medical attention from Scottish women's hospitals. Of the 3,000 recruits and decimated regiments that arrived in Corsica from Serbia on the Great Retreat, 30,000 schoolboys and students from Serbia who'd set out on the retreat, only 7,000 survived to get to Corsica. It's amazing what these women did and how grateful Serbia was for them. They did things apart from sticking them on stamps. Letter from M. Pacic, Prime Minister of Serbia, Claridge's Hotel, London, 4th of April, 1916. To the President of the Executive Committee of the Scottish Women's Hospitals for Foreign Service. Dear Madam, our Minister in London, Monsieur, Monsieur Bochkovic, inv informs me that Doctors E. Inglis and Hutchinson, together with the members of their representative units, have recently returned from Serbia, where they had remained as long as they could, taking care of our wounded soldiers. In the name of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, in the name of the Serbian government and of the whole Serbian nation, I have the honour to convey through you the expressions of our highest gratitude to the noble daughters of the great British nation who have risked their lives and sacrificed their freedom for the health and the good of the Serbian soldier and the Serbian people. I avail myself of this opportunity to tell you how much we appreciate the help rendered to Serbia by the Scottish Women's Association, who sent so many and so splendidly organised hospitals to our country, and who will who are still continuing to help our people as much as they can. The Serbian nation will never forget what the Scottish women have done for them. Yours very sincerely, Prime Minister of Serbia, Nikolai P. Pacic. Altogether, there were 13 hospitals set up by the Scottish women. As I said, the Serbian army had regrouped, retrained, and was about to move to the southern end of the Eastern Front to support the Russian army against Bulgaria and the Austro-German Axis. The Serbian minister in London in 2016 asked Dr. Inglis if the Scottish Women's Hospitals would provide a field hospital service for the Serbian division in Russia. James, I'm very conscious of the time and I've got a little bit about the Eastern Front, but I don't want to run on too long. That's fine. Uh, we've got plenty of time. OK, fine. I'm just very conscious I'm taking a bit longer than I usually do. No, 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 no problem at all. OK, thank you. So very rapidly, the women's hospitals managed to equip and dispatch two field hospitals. Each of them had a motor transport to the division attached to them. This map shows the eastern front at around this time. That's the heavy blue line. Units set sail from Liverpool on the 30th of August, 1916, sailing to Archangel, right up in the north of Russia. 
They then traveled by rail with all of their equipment, beds, blankets, drugs, operating theaters, by train, all the way to Odessa. It took 11 days, some interesting things on the journey that we won't talk about. They were heading from Odessa towards the uh, Dobruja area where the main Romanian, sorry, Romanian Serbian troops were fighting on that front. I'm afraid I've not been able to find a massive number of photographs for this part, but I have got some information to try and give you an account of where we've been. They rested in Odessa for a few days, and then they set out to go towards the front. They traveled, first of all, to a place called Reni, and then by road, they then joined the Danube and went down to a place called Zernavoda. Their names have all changed, and I find it really struggled to pronounce these names. And from there, they were heading for to set up their base camp at Majidia. All the transport and the stores were moved on two barges. This was the coordination center for the Serbian army, and a hospital was set up looking overlooking Majidia, and it was next door to the Russian Red Cross Hospital. The situation was pretty grave. The first Serbian unit in action had suffered heavily. heavily. They'd gone into the battle with 14,000 strong, with the Romanians on the left flank with the Russian army on the right flank. Very soon, the enemy broken through the Russian flank, leaving the army in disarray. And the Serbians stood their ground, fighting for 24 hours on two fronts. And they came out with only 4,000 men. No patients arrived that night, Tuesday, but the next morning the cars were ordered out and at once the wounded began to pour in. We bathed them all and dressed most, but the first dressings were excellently done and had done four necessary operations by three o'clock the next morning. We had taken in 102 patients, two of whom died almost immediately, and we were full. The cars had been running steadily both to the hospital and the station until after 10 when Mrs Haverfield ordered the chauffeur to bed to start again at 5am. Miss Henderson got no sleep that night for she insisted on seeing us to bed first and then the transport off at 5. We evacuated almost half our patients after 48 hours rest and took in more but we found a hundred mattresses in those two rooms, too close for proper nursing, so we reduced the number to 75 and decided to pitch our camp for the personnel and take the upstairs floor for the hospital. Evelina Haverfield was with the transport division and she wrote, okay. Okay. The road to Equibia was just a track across endless plains after leaving the main road to Mulbul Mare. Here the usual struggle began to get the cars through the mud. We found the place all smoking and much battered by shells. We filled up with the wounded, two in each car, and got them safely back. After a few days of this work, we received the order to pitch camp at Bulbul Mik, 10 miles from Majida. Here enemy aeroplanes visited us daily, dealing death and destruction everywhere. But we all escaped injury. The days were lovely and warm, but the nights were very cold and damp. Suddenly wounded began to pour in, and we and the hospital worked night and day. Things were not going well at the front, and we were told we might have to evacuate at any moment. There were a few cases of cholera, and we were asked to keep an ambulance separate from the others 
in order to take cases to the isolation hospitals. One of the drivers, Ruth Plimsoll, had charge of the particular ambulance and drove a wounded officer all the way to Chernovoda, accompanied by the doctor. When they arrived there, the doctor went to find the right place to deposit his patient. A longer process, and meanwhile, bombs suddenly began to fall on all sides. Ruth Plimsoll remained calmly on her seat, and when the doctor returned and the car moved away, a bomb fell in the exact spot where the ambulance had been waiting, making a large hole in the ground. The patient, in spite of his pain, insisted on having Ruth Plimsoll's name written down and told the doctor that if he lived, he would see she got a special decoration for the great courage she had shown. Most of our drivers have been in the midst of falling bombs whilst carrying wounded, especially to the station, and all have shown the highest courage and perfect calmness amidst frantic panic on the part of all in the street at the time. Things continued to get worse for the army and things were rather complicated by the beginning of 1917 was when the Russian Revolution had started. And these early days of unrest and rebellion had a serious effect on the efficiency of the Russian military. The Scottish women's hostels were ordered to evacuate and retreat. And in the event, they were the last medical units to move back. In the following letter to the London Committee, Dr Ingis plays tribute to her unit's work. In case this arrives before my report, I should like to say first that the committee may be thoroughly satisfied with the work done and the spirit displayed by almost every member of the unit. They worked magnificently at Majida and took the retreat in a very joyous, indomitable way. One cannot say they were plucky because I don't think it ever entered their heads to be afraid. In the middle of a panic, when people were actually running along the road and throwing things off the carts to lighten them, and men with their rifles and bayonets were actually climbing onto our Red Cross carts to save a few minutes, our girls in that particular party were picking up the thrown away vegetables and things they wanted. The last live days at Majeda, when we were bombed by aeroplanes every day, they did not even stop their work to go back and look. And so the chaotic retreat was pulling back ahead of the rapidly advancing enemy to Bralia. They camped where they could, scourged food and set up temporary dressing stations to treat the hundreds of wounded that were converging on them. The enemy advanced and they retreated further by barge until the river was blocked and then by road to Galatia a large seaport on the Danube, and then eventually back to Odessa, where they received the communication from the Foreign Secretary. On the 30th of, 30th of December, the following communication was received by the London Committee from the Secretary of the Admiralty. Madam, I am commanded by the Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty to acquaint you that a report has been received from an officer of the Royal Navy who visited certain ports of the Danube in October last, 1916, which contains the following remarks on the Scottish Women's Hospital at Braille. A camp of the Scottish Women's Hospital was here at Braille 28th of October, having retreated from Mahidia where they were nearly forgotten and left behind. He, General Zhaoutkowski, like everyone else, had nothing but praise for the Scottish Women's Hospital, whose motor ambulances were the first thing to be noticed on landing at Braille. They have lost all their kits in the retreat. I am, Madam, your obedient servant, J. W. S. Anderson, Foreign Secretary. They are pretty chaotic on the retreat, with locals retreating soldiers, and they moved back as fast as they could. Uh, this was in October 2016, at the beginning of a really grim winter. The Danube was quite useful as a barrier, really quite a big river. Um, but once the winter came and it froze, it was possible to cross it. And of course, the Germans managed to cross it. Uh, by the end of November 16, 
German forces were across and the Allied forces and the Scottish women's hospitals were in rapid retreat. Anyway, they arrived and set up a hospital in Odessa in January 17, where they were for the next eight months. And so from the inspiration of one strong independent woman, Elsie Ingalls, who knew her own mind and had the drive to get what she wanted, up came 13 hospitals staffed by women in many battlefields and in places of much need. The Serbs never forgot the women of the Scottish Women Hospitals, but we seem to have done so. Despite the amazing achievements by the women doctors during the First World War, once it was over, women doctors were marginalised again. It was a long and slow road for them to get equality. When I went to medical school in 1965, only one in 10 students in my year was a woman. Today, there are as many female medical students as male ones, but women surgeons are still in a minority and it's still a male dominated uh, environment, although getting better. Thank you very much for your attention. These are my sources of the information and the people who helped by doing the reading for me. And I hope that was OK. Well, thank you very much, uh, John. As always, that was a, a very, very interesting talk about some absolutely fantastic women. Incredible, aren't they? I mean... Uh, Charles, did you learn anything? Yeah, most certainly I did, yes. I had no idea what uh, my grandma had been up to and uh, uh, <laughs> certainly very impressed by uh, uh, what she clearly had to do. Bearing in mind... <laughs> came from a middle-class background in uh, family in Cambridge. It must have, uh, uh, retreating across uh, frozen mountains, must have been a, a altogether grim experience for her. So, no, thank you very much for that. If you like, I'll send you the title of that book. If you could, I'd be, mo I'd be yeah, most I'll, better. I'll do it by, by James, because he's got your email. Yeah, thank uh, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you got any questions, uh, Charles? Well, I, I, what what became of um, uh, Maud Inglis? I mean, she uh... actually I missed that out, didn't I? She died. She, hang on, let, uh, let me go back to my presentation because I can't remember what I said. Um, she knew from about two thousand and sixteen that she'd got cancer, but she kept it quiet. Nineteen sixteen. Yeah. Yes. Right. Ah, yeah. uh, hear me. I forgot that. That was very careless of me. That was because I was rushed at the end. Uh, yeah, she she realised that she was had it in in nineteen sixteen, and she died of cancer shortly after they started. They, they went they on the way back, when they went back up to um, the north of Russia to get a ship back to England, she yeah. died before she reached England. Oh, they did right, and so uh, but but they managed to keep the body because she was buried in Scotland with a with a good service. But right, but she did she receive any. Uh, uh, any honours or awards for other than uh, uh, from, from from United Kingdom or, or yes, yes, she, she did. They um they 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 got awards. They got um the Order of Saint John gave them awards. They had uh the the Cri de Guerre from France. The Serbs gave them quite a lot. The Serbs erected a, a memorial to them, in, particularly the nurses who died. All right, and uh. And She's probably too busy to have a a family or a private life, wasn't she? Yes, she was. Right. Yeah. No, very interesting. Yeah, she character. had a lot of brothers and sisters, and she was a great, apparently a great aunt uh, to lots of nephews and nieces who used to. It all comes out in in. I tell you, the best book for that is Lady Bolfer's book. It's a bit bit uh, flowery language and archaic, but it describes some of the more private side of Elsie's life, and particularly the time in India. Which is quite interesting. Yeah, I yeah. Didn't, didn't think it was relevant to this particular talk. No, no, thank you. But in the in John in your previous talk, the the papers were full of praises for these two ladies. Yeah. In Belgium, presumably there wasn't any press coverage at all of these. These. I didn't get the sense that there was. No. No, no I didn't get the sense at all. Uh, I mean, the fact that they were they were funded by the suffrage movement. Whenever they needed money, it seemed to appear, <laughs> and and oh, the suffrage the, movement. Yeah, the the, the the they seemed to switch away from getting the vote to coming around to support 
the, the war effort and they they put a lot of effort into the Edinburgh women. Really? Women, yeah, the hospitals. Yeah. I they, mean, was the suffrage movement quite wealthy? I mean, did it have a sort of a... It had a broad spectrum of, of membership from the aristocracy down to the sort of lower classes, really. Um, I I think the money came when they asked for it. I don't right. think it, yeah. I understand. I it, it pulled them together and something to focus on. Yeah. Uh, and it certainly highlighted what women could do. Yeah. yeah. It still took a while for them to get the vote, but there we are, since them to get their medical degrees. Those original Edinburgh Seven doctors that did their first training, actually in 150 years later, Edinburgh University gave seven medical students who stood in for the seven women the rewards that they should have had, their honorary medical degrees, 150 years too late, but they got them. <laughs> it's a sad indictment of uh, the male-dominated society of that uh, era. It is, and it's um, still like that, of course, in parts of the world, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Brilliant talk, as always, John. Really very, very good. And I do like the, the you know, your pictures and... Uh, the readings, I make it uh, make yeah. it to life a lot more. Yeah, I, well, I, I had to do it that way. It would have been very boring otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Louise, have you got any questions? Got a... Right. Oh, okay. No, I'm fine, thank you very much. And I'm sorry my camera's off, but I'm cooking supper at the same time. <laughs> Multitasking, like a good girl. <laughs> Excellent. I'm about to go and cook my supper. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you. Thank you for listening. And uh, it's ten past it seven, so I think we'll we'll bring the whole thing to a close. But that that was excellent, and I will um, support your charity as 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 I did last time. Thank you very much indeed. Well, nice well. to meet nice to meet you all, and hopefully there'll be some people watching it on recording. Oh, they will. They yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.